All right, let's get started. So today, last time in lecture, we talked about least squares and essentially how you build a model of data, in this case, by essentially putting a line to this data. Right? We have a bunch of data points, something hard to predict, like estimating the electrical demand from uh, the high temperature of the day. And we fit a model using just a straight line through that. Right? And if you remember, part of that process was, essentially the process from a, from a high picture, is that we defined a loss function, which is how close we wanted our predictions, in it, or in what sense we wanted our predictions to be close to the true values. And we ended up fitting this line by minimizing that loss function. Um, and for the case of least squares, that was a squared error loss function. So it was, we take our prediction value, our actual value for each point, we take the predicted value minus the actual value, and we square that. And we're trying to pick parameters, which impact our predicted value here, that will minimize this measure over all our data points. And that was how we derived least squares for this class. What we're going to talk about today is a couple other things. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is why did we choose that squared error function? Why not something else? Why not say the absolute difference between the input or the output? Or maybe we don't care if our output, as long as our output is within a certain range of the true output, we're going to say our predicted guess is just as good. So we're going to talk about that first, and along the way I'm going to talk a little bit about convex optimization a little more, and about how we can solve some of these problems using that convex solver I mentioned before. This was that YALMIP library. Now you can also solve it in much more, kind of a much more complex way by directly manipulating the equations to get a more standard form of optimization problem. And we'll go through that also, how you do that, because this was how you used to solve these problems. Um, but it turns out that for at least small scale problems, libraries like YALMIP, which you'll, which you'll use from the first homework shortly, are, are just much easier at sort of getting a first pass at these kind of things. So then we'll move after this to nonlinear regression. And linear regression uh, usually is thought of as fitting a line to data, right? So we saw our data, it kind of uh, lay on a line, right? I'll have a you saw the graph before, right? The high temperature versus the peak demand for the summer lies approximately on a line. Uh, but what if the data does not lie in a line? What do you do then? We'll talk about how you deal with this fact. And it turns out that our framework we set up here, which is in terms of making predictions that are functions of features of the input, it turns out we can extend that very naturally to the nonlinear setting. And we get a lot more power, can get a lot more power in our models using the same exact math as before. Uh, the difference is, is we now need to construct some nonlinear features of the data. And I'll talk about explicitly constructing these. So just actually building a few different types of nonlinear features. And then also talk about doing this implicitly using a I think it's really gone, gained a lot of momentum in uh, machine learning the last, say, 15, probably almost 20 years now, but using kernels. So one, kind of one of the most advanced methods in machine learning that people use commonly. Um, but before that, are there any questions about the material from last time, the derivation of least squares for the, for the linear setting I showed before? None, really? Okay. So as a preface too, this lecture and the next one will probably be along the more mathematical lectures of this course. Um, so if it, seems, if it seems a little bit daunting, don't worry. It probably will be one of the harder lectures that we go through. Um, maybe the one next time even, because I'm not sure how much we'll get to kernels. But these, they require a little bit of mathematical rigor. All right, so let's talk about now alternative loss functions a couple times now, but again, why do we choose squared loss? 
Uh, we choose it. Well, you can come up with all sorts of justifications for it, really. You can motivate it in various ways. But really, I think we choose it because it's easy to solve. Um, and you can write the derivation that I wrote last time, and you get a nice analytical solution for this estimate and for our parameters theta. Let's now talk about some alternatives that I mentioned before. So we could talk about the absolute error, the difference in absolute value between the prediction and the true value. Or we can talk about what's, what I'm calling a dead band loss. And this is kind of interesting. This is a loss that's kind of like the absolute error, except we say that within a certain distance epsilon from the optimum, we have zero loss. So what we're saying is, I don't care if our prediction is at most epsilon away from the true value, where you pick epsilon based on you know, the scaling of the actual problem itself. But we're saying, of, of the outputs that is, you know, how, how big these things are. We're saying we don't care if it's, if it's within epsilon. We're just going to treat that as being having zero loss, being fine with that. And the way we can write this is um, the absolute value term, the difference, the, the absolute value of the difference here, so that's just the absolute value loss, minus this number epsilon, but that would be potentially negative then, and loss functions can't be negative, that would be kind of giving you credit for going, getting somewhere, and that's really, not really fair, so then we have to max it with zero. And this is a graph of what these loss functions actually look like in some sense. This, this graph here shows the predicted output minus the true output. It's hard to make hats in the axes in MATLAB, so I'm using the subscript pred. And for the squared loss, this is just the quadratic function, right? It's just this difference squared. For the absolute loss, it's just the absolute value of this thing, right? The little kink at zero there. And for the dead band loss, it's like the absolute loss, but it actually goes to zero and stays zero for a while and then comes back up. This would be with epsilon equal to one, because we're saying that from negative one to one, we have zero loss. There are a lot of other possibilities too, I should add. I can't even begin to describe all the potential loss functions that we could have. Um, you might have heard of things like the Huber loss. Um, you could also have the squared version of the dead band loss, things like this. I won't get into any of those, uh, but it's good to at least know that there are a lot of different potential loss functions that have very different kinds of behavior. And for now, I won't talk, I'll talk very briefly at the end here about why we might prefer one of these over another. But for now, my focus is going to be how can we solve our problem if we use one of these losses? Okay, so remember, the way we wrote our problem we wanted to solve was we wanted to minimize over theta the sum over all our examples from i equals 1 to m. Remember we said we have m different data points of the loss of our predicted example and the true label, the true output, yi. Now for the squared loss, this was the sum of squared errors. But for the absolute value loss, that's just going to be this term. That's the same thing here, right? Because our predicted value, I'll just write this, try to sneak it all in there. Our predicted value, remember, by our definition of the model, was theta transpose phi xi. And then for the absolute loss, we take the absolute value of the difference between these two things. So that's our objective that we want to, to solve. And you remember with the least squares problem, what we did is we took derivatives here. We call them gradients because they're a derivative of a vector with respect to a vector. We took, gradients, we took the gradient of this thing. And we set that equal to zero. And that's how we solved this problem. Right? Now the problem here is that the absolute value is not differentiable. Right? So that's kind of tricky. It has this point here where there's no unique derivative. 
of the function. No derivative at all, actually. There would be a other more complex things like sub-differentials, but we won't worry about those here. We can't take the derivative here. And that, and that isn't sort of a minor thing. We can't just say, oh, well, that's just one point. This is actually a, a big deal because the solutions may, in fact, have a lot of points right there. And so this is actually a, 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 a big deal. And we can't solve it in the way we solve these squares. We can't just take the gradient, set it to equal, equal to 0, and have that be that. So what do we do instead? This is a common theme in optimization. Um, and part of the point of your exercises in this lecture is that we don't, in fact, have to be this complex anymore. Right? We have libraries that actually, namely YALMIP and other ones, that actually let us essentially plug in this expression exactly as it is and just solve it. But I want to at least run through how you used to have to do this if you wanted to solve a problem like this. Um, and again, if, if, if this part seems a little bit complex, don't worry. Kind of the point is that it is a little bit complex. And, and uh, that's why it's very nice. You'll see one slide at the end where you just solve that immediately. I should add, though, that YALMIP is doing this exact transformation we're going to do. It's just doing it internally. So you have to go through it still. You can't get away from this. But the solvers that we have right now are very general and can actually do this for a wide range of problems in a very nice way. OK, so let's talk about how you solve this problem. To do this, we need to introduce some new variables. And I'm going to call these new variables new i. I'm going to set up a problem where new i is going to be an upper bound on this absolute value here. Okay, so I'm going to set up an optimization problem where new i is an upper bound on that. Theta transpose phi xi minus yi is going to be upper bounded by new i. Now, this is a constrained problem now, um, but it's still not quite obvious. I mean, we still have a, a non-differentiable function here. Um, it's still not quite clear how we would you know, plug this into a lot of solvers. So we do a little trick here. And that is, this thing holds, this is a bound on the absolute value, if and only if, well, first of all, it just has to be, new i has to be greater than it. So I'm going to take off the absolute value here. I'm going to set yi, sorry. I'm going to set this whole thing to be less than or equal to new i. And then I'm also going to say that negative new i is less than this plus than equal to that. And hopefully, after thinking about it for a little while, you can convince yourself that this will always imply that. Th these two really are equivalent. And this will imply that too. Right? Because if, say, this is positive, right? Then this thing's positive. Well, new eyes here will also be positive because negative new i has to be less than new i, so new i has to be bigger than or equal to zero. If this thing is positive, then its absolute value is just this thing itself, and so new i is going to be greater than that. If this thing is negative, then it can't be too far negative because it can't be any lo less than negative new i. Right, so in both cases here, new i is bounding either the positive value here or the negative value here. And so new i is, in fact, always going to be an upper bound on the absolute value. So I've written this out. And now, instead of just minimizing all of these quantities, 
I'm going to minimize over theta the sum over all i of just nu i. And this is a little bit harder to see also, but it turns out that this, if we minimize this, which is an upper bound, at the solution that we get, these will always be equal. And that's just simple, simply for the reason we're trying to minimize these sums here, right? If this value was strictly greater than this, it wouldn't be a very good solution, right? Because we could lower that new i more and make it equal to that. So if we minimize the sum of the new i's subject to this inequality constraint, then at the solution, this will in fact hold with equality. And so we're in fact solving our original problem here. Let's take a few steps to get here. This is why these things for a long time were kind of the domain of people that only knew about linear programming and all these kind of techniques. Um, but as I said, now that's becoming less and less true. And so what we get with, what we get at the end is this problem. And I wrote here actually minimize over just theta, but really we're minimizing over both theta and nu here because they're both variables in our problem, right? We need to encode these as both being variables. We're minimizing the sum of these nu's here. Uh, if you ever heard the term slack variable, if you haven't, don't worry about that. But nu's here are slack variables. They essentially provide some slack, so they're kind of like an upper bound. So they can be bigger, but they can never be less than this, right? So there's a little bit of slack there. And we're introducing, introducing, introducing these new variables and minimizing the slack. Again, if you haven't heard that formulation, don't worry. It's just that if you have ever heard that in a paper or something like that, this is exactly what that is. Okay, so now there's something that's very interesting. This is what's called a linear program. Who here has heard of a linear program before? Just by a show of hands. Okay, a good number, but not quite everyone. So this, a linear program, is an optimi optimization problem where the objective and all the constraints are linear functions of the variables. So we can have terms like, watch me, I'll just wait till the next slide. Um, you know, this is our variable here, this is a variable, and all these equations here are just some linear function of the variables. And the nice thing about linear programs, they are convex programs, and so we can solve them using off-the-shelf tools. Are we going to sleep again? Hang on, let me just plug it in. It should have plenty of battery, but it's not cooperating. They didn't uh, switch slides fast enough. I spent too much time on that one. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is a linear program, this final formulation we have here, which is nice because it means we can solve it. Now, the problem, though, is that in order to solve a linear program, you have to put it in what's called standard form, usually. You can't just plug something like this into a software package, or at least you couldn't before with the ones we have. Uh, you couldn't plug this into a software package and expect it to just be solved. Um, you need to put it in a standard form. And that standard form is usually something like the following. I'm going to call the variables now z, because z, in fact, could be in our case, both theta and nu. We want to minimize now over z, c transpose z, that's a vector c taking the inner product with z, subject to some matrix a times z 
which will result in a vector, being less than or equal to some other vector b. And this is a, what's called the standard form linear program. You can also add equality constraints. There's other slightly different forms that people oftentimes use. But this is a very common form for linear programs. And in order to solve our problem, we have to put it in this form. So again, this is another kind of tricky step. We first have the tricky step of figuring out how to make that absolute value be this linear constraint. Now we have to put that linear constraint, this constraint here, in a form like this. And here's the answer. Here's how you do it. So maybe I'll describe it a little bit. Um, so what, so how, how, do I, how did I come up with this? OK, well, our variables, remember we only have one variable. We don't have two sets of variables in, this, in the standard form, nu and theta. We just have one z. So I'm going to define our variable z to be a vector of all the variables, theta and nu. Where nu here is going to be, I should say, uh, nu, all of them, is going to be a vector in Rm, right? Because you have a separate new i for each xi. So I'm going to define our variables this way, theta and nu. Our objective is c transpose z, right? So that's just going to be equal to some function of this. And the way to get the function that we want, which is the sum of all the new i's, is to make c equal to 0, which is really a vector of zeros, um, whose size is kind of implied by the notation that we're using for the problem. Um, it's really going to be a 0 of k, a k-dimensional vector of zeros, because theta is k dimensions. And then a m-dimensional vector of 1s. And oftentimes I'll leave out the actual designation of how big these things are, because it actually is going to be implied by the problem. And so you don't need to write, you know, this is m1s and, and k0s is just sort of obvious from the, from the problem. So that's the objective. That's kind of the easy part. Now let's talk about the constraints. So as we did with the least squares problem, we can write these constraints in vector form. Right? Remember in least squares, we sort of said, OK, we have each individual theta transpose xi, but I'm going to write that as a big matrix phi where fees are the fees of all the xi's. And we're going to subtract that from that. We're going to subtract the vector of all the y's. So I'll write this expression here, which is for one example i. I can also write it, use our notation from last time, as theta, sorry, phi times theta minus y. This is a vector of all the y's now being less than or equal to nu. And when you have two vectors and say one is less than or equal to another, that means element-wise. Every element of this is less than every element of that, the corresponding element, sorry. Every element here is less than the corresponding element of this vector. And I can also do it on the other side too, negative nu. So now I need to write this still has you know, news on some side and, and, and the thetas on other sides. We still need to write it in this form. And after some playing around, you can come up with it. And oops, I meant. what you get is you need to essentially move all the terms that don't depend on variables, which are the y's here, into the b term. All the things that multiply the variables into the a term. And what you get eventually is, for example, this constraint here would say that phi times theta, so I'm going to put phi there, uh, minus nu, so this will be negative identity here, is less than or equal to. The first element here would be positive y. So 
Similarly, this other side, remember this is a less than or equal to here, so you have to sort of play the right tricks here. If you rearrange this all so that this equality, inequality is represented, you'll get negative phi, negative i, and negative y. Um, don't worry about if you didn't catch that quite then. Uh, what I would do is I would sort of go by it, go through it step by step. In fact, you'll have similar problems in your, in your homework. So part of the point of this is that it is kind of tricky to do, and it's very easy to mess up a negative sign here and flip it, and then your problem's just wrong. You're not solving the problem you thought you were solving. Um, and this is sort of what you have to go through to solve problems like this in the past. So you have all that. You now construct your LP in standard form, and you can solve it with, for example, the lin-prog function in MATLAB. So here is how you used to have to do this. So we want to minimize this absolute error, right? That was, that was our only goal, just minimize absolute error here. Um, we set up a big LP. Well, first of all, we have to figure out all this math, right? We have to do the math first. Then we write it in MATLAB, where we say, we you know, assign our C matrix, our A matrix, our B matrix. We solve Z, and the call there is lin-prog, where the first uh, argument is the C matrix, then the A matrix, sorry, C vector, A matrix, and the B vector. What we get out is our solution, Z, so it's the optimal Z here. If we want to recover down just the parameters, we take the first, should it be K, not N of these, but we take the first K of them. Okay, so that, that, that's quite a bunch of hoops to jump through. Just from changing the squared sign to the absolute error sign. And the point of, I think, a lot of newer optimization methods here is that we can, in fact, solve this in YALMIP very efficiently. Or very, not efficiently, sorry, very quickly and easily. Efficient in your time, if not the computer's time. And if you remember, the, the basic code for YALMIP was we just, we'd find a theta as SDP var n1. Still should be K1 there, sorry about that. Um, and then we call the solve STP function where we, uh, before with the squared error, it was just the square of this thing, right? The sum of all the elements squared. And the cool thing now, and that was a sort of a silly way to solve a least squares problem because we could just say phi backslash y, but the nice thing here is that in Yalnip, you can really just write, instead of a square term, you write an absolute term. And that solves it. And you're kind of done. You don't have to go through all this. Again, it's not bad to know this, and it's probably good to know how this works internally for simple things like this. But there are some very complex manipulations you can do too, where this can be very hard to do. And things like Yalnip can really be invaluable to saving your time, especially if Maybe it's a bad loss function in the end, right? You didn't even want to optimize that loss function. It gives you a bad solution. You spend a day deriving how to solve it in a standard solver, only to find it's not what you wanted. So these tools are, are excellent help for uh, pro problems like this, where you can just quickly check something, maybe on a smaller size uh, data set. OK, are there any, problem, are there any questions about this? Again, it's sort of meant, this was meant to illustrate the challenges going through this, though, though it is good to know how this all works as well. What was the first parameter? Um, this parameter is constraints. So you, you, the solve SDP passes a set of constraints and, a, and then the objective function. And in this case, we could set it up just like this and actually put the constraint, say, A is less than or equal to B, and solve this just as a linear program. But it's easier in some sense to just avoid that, right? And just put in the objective only, because there aren't kind of real constraints here. There's just only constraints because we added these slack variables. So here, in the simple case, there are no constraints. And so you just pass the empty matrix. We'll use constraints later in some later problems. We can't get away from those. 
Okay, any other questions? All right, so the last thing I want to say about different loss functions is which one should we use? And there's no good answer to this, really. Right? There's no general answer. Because the loss function you use depends somewhat on the actual goal you have in mind. If you're, say, doing this prediction, forecasting, as part of the utility, you're doing it for the utility, they may have some kind of monetary loss that they suffer if you get it wrong. Ideally, that would be exactly what you'd be optimizing, right? Oftentimes, those are not in a nice form, so you can't optimize those. Um, but ideally, you like to optimize the actual loss that kind of is specific to your application. But people don't often do that. What people often do is just optimize one of these things. And there are some differences between the different loss functions, I should add. There are definite differences between the behavior of different functions. For example, the squared error gets, because it, the, the error grows with the square of your difference between your predicted and actual, if you have a lot of data that's very close to the correct value, but then a one data point that just the model is way, way off, it'll actually try very hard to get that one thing to do better on that one example. Because that different squared becomes big really fast. Whereas the absolute error is just a linear function, right? And so that grows much slower, and so you won't try quite as hard, again, kind of informally speaking, to get that one data point, so to make sure you do well on that one data point. And, because, and for this reason, sometimes uh, absolute loss is called a robust method. It's robust to outliers in the data. The truth, though, is that for a lot of problems, as you can see from this graph here, these perform kind of similarly. Again, not always. There are important differences. But here, I plotted three different errors. I plot the squared loss, the absolute loss, and the dead band loss uh, using that dead band of, of 0 0.1. And they're essentially they look very, very similar. I mean, I, I can't know why we might choose one of these over the other. And in fact, with, without knowing which one was which, I can make up a story now about, oh, the absolute loss is obviously that one because there's a bigger outlier over here and you know, that's, squared loss is more affected by that. But I, I wouldn't be able to tell if I hadn't seen the actual labels here. In this case, obviously some cases where you have, say, a couple outliers, you might want to think about using absolute loss or something like that. But, but in a lot of cases, and kind of why people get away with squared loss a lot, even though it's not the right loss function, is that it's easy to use and it gives a solution that's very similar to some other complex loss, like that would have been. Um, that's a very imprecise statement. They all perform similarly and they in fact can be arbitrarily different in how they perform. Um, but in practice, this is something that happens a lot of the time. So it's good to keep in mind and it kind of does excuse us for using squared loss in a lot of situations. There are other reasons too, like probabilistic assumptions, but people apply it even when those are completely violated. And so this is a, this is a reasonable reason for that. It's just in practice it works pretty well. Okay, so th that's the last I'm going to say about the purely linear regression. Now we're going to move on now to the nonlinear models. Um, but are there any questions about any of this? Okay. All right. So thus far, the example I gave you was this very nice example where the data actually kind of did lie on a line, right? In the summer, electricity consumption is, is more or less proportional to temperature, which makes sense because people use a lot of air conditioning. And so when it gets hotter, they'll use more electricity. That's a big use of electricity. Um, but I kind, of, I kind of picked that intentionally, right, knowing that's what would happen here. If we look at the entire year, uh, the models we had before would essentially predict that, oh, well, as the temperature gets lower and lower, we'll just keep using less and less energy. You know, right down to the point when it's zero degrees as a high, we'll just use nothing. It's actually less than that, right, because it was like 
the intercept of that line was like negative. So I guess when it's zero degrees out, we must be generating power, uh, which is not what happens, as you can imagine. So let's go back to our example, this running example of predicting high temperature, sorry, predicting uh, demand from high temperature. And let's look at it for the whole year. So this is what it looks like now where I'm not cheating anymore for the whole year. So now, what we sort of saw before was just kind of this part here, right? Which kind of goes up in a nice slope here. As things get, uh, things get hotter, we use more energy. But as you would expect, there's a tailing off effect, right? We sort of don't keep that trend going forever. At a certain point, we don't use AC, and so we're not going to use any more, any less power than none. Uh, we want to use other things like lights and computers too, so we're not going to use none. Um, and then, as you also might expect, uh, as it gets colder now, you know, most heating here is uh, through gas or things like this, so not electricity. Um, but as it gets, gets colder, you know, it also gets darker here, we might use more lighting. There are some electric heaters people use. So you might expect, as you might expect, we start again using more power as the high temperature gets colder and colder. And so this, these, this pl these plots here are from all the days from 2008 to 2011. So four years worth of data in this chart here. So now the question is, if we just sort of fit a line through this, that wouldn't really capture what's happening here, right? Because that would kind of maybe be like this or something. That would be a pretty bad model for this data. Wouldn't give us very good predictions. So what are we going to do? The answer, as you probably guessed from the title of the slide, is to use nonlinear methods. Um, but again, reinforcing it, because it's a very, very important point. The actual math for nonlinear methods is essentially identical to that for linear regression. It's just this feature vector phi that changes. Okay, so how does this work? Well, in the case before, our linear models had kind of a slope term and an intercept term, right? So we were defining B of xi to, to a two-dimensional vector for one-dimensional inputs, at least, that had the xi term and then a constant term 1. What we can do instead and this is really the central idea of nonlinear methods, is that we just add nonlinear functions in this feature vector. So rather than having x, xi and 1, we say also put xi squared there. So for every input point, we take that input's point value, also a constant term, but then also that input's point value squared. And we now have three numbers here, and so we'll have a vector theta with three different parameters instead of just two. But this will capture richer models. And I'll show you an example of this in a second, but the th overall theme of this lecture is that there really are two ways to construct these kind of feature vectors. The first is just to actually, well, construct them. You just do this, exactly. Um, but there are a couple problems there, which we'll get to in a second. Especially as you have a higher dimensional input. How do you go about constructing these things? The second thing we can do, which kind of solves this part of the problem here, is that we can actually, and this takes some time to sort of get, but once you sort of see it, it's actually quite, they're really pretty simple. But we can actually use high dimensional feature vectors without ever constructing them explicitly. This is using a method called kernels, which as I said has been one of the big themes in machine learning, kind of at the forefront of machine learning in the past almost 20 years now. And if you ever heard words like support vector machines or Gaussian processes, there's certainly a lot more than just kernels there, but a big part of why these things became so popular was that they use kernels in very efficient manners. And we'll define those more rigorously in a second, but, but uh, just introducing the term for the time being. Okay, so 
what does this actually look like? Suppose we were to add a feature vector that had this squared term. Well now, instead of just lines, we can actually capture quadratic functions, right? We're using a quadratic function to approximate the data. So for example, if we use a feature vector with a maximum degree, and d here is the maximum degree, of a second degree polynomial, we can approximate this function here as a quadratic. So there's some linear term here plus some quadratic term, plus a constant term. That's a better fit, right? Clearly, that, that's, this, is, this, this looks a little bit better than if we were to just draw a line through it. If we use, maybe, but you might say, oh no, it's still not great, right? Because there's still this sort of, it sort of diverges here from it. Um, it doesn't quite get this tail, either tail really. It's kind of, you know, it's not quite right. You wouldn't draw this line through it if you were drawing it yourself, or this curve through it if you're drawing it yourself. So maybe we're going to use a degree three polynomial. We can do that too, approximately with a cubic function now. Um, it, it will oftentimes, you sort of see this kind of thing tail off here, and that might seem unexpected. One thing to keep in mind is that once you get outside the range of the data that we're fitting it to, uh, very odd things can happen. And we're not going to worry too much about what happens outside this range, because these are polynomial functions, right? They can go through the data very well and then kind of go off in crazy ways once you get outside the data. So these are really meant to be used in new data points that lie within this range. That's, that's sort of, broadly speaking, that there is some ability to maybe go a little bit outside the boundaries here. Um, but in general, you know, don't worry, don't be too dissuaded by, by the things that happen over here. If they happen in between data points though, right, if this were to like go up there, that would be a problem. Because this is sort of within the range that we've seen before, um, it's still kind of doing poorly. So keep that in mind as you sort of look at how good these fits are. All right, and, or maybe a degree four would be better, right? We have a little, little bit better. And as you imagine, as you raise the degree higher, you can get kind of better fits to the data. Though, if you get too high, maybe some bad things happen. And we'll cover a lot about those, what those bad things can be uh, throughout this lecture. So, this is great. We can use the same techniques here, the exact same techniques. Remember, this is the feature vector. So, right as before, we define our big matrix of feature vectors. I'll say this is, this is going to be in RK. Our matrix will still be in RM by K. This is a big matrix with the feature vectors for each example in the rows of the matrix, remember. Um, and we still have the exact same solution as before. We still have the least squared solution, at least, with a squared error. would just be uh, theta equals phi transpose phi inverse phi transpose y. The only difference is we've added some elements to these vectors here. And we now have the power of nonlinear models. That's very nice, right? We had not a lot of work, but got this much more expressive power. Um, a little bit more generally, two types of feature vectors that are very common <laughs> are the polynomial features, which you saw before, which is a vector of all these features up to some degree d. That's for the case when the input is one dimensional. When it's more than one dimensional, say if we had high and low temperature as our inputs, then things get a little bit trickier, right? Because now we need to sort of have all possible combinations of both values of, you know, the first element times the second element, first element squared, second element squared, these kind of things. So we actually, in general, We'll have a form that looks like this. Um, I'm using subscripts here. I'm, I'm treating z as my general input to a feature mapping. And here, at least, I'm going to use the subscript i to talk about indexing into a certain value in z. That's why I don't use x here, because that would be xi subscript j or something like that. So I'll just more too much and just which one we're doing. You should probably get used to the fact that people are going to be ambiguous and sometimes use i to index over a set of things. Sometimes use it to index into a variable. Uh, hopefully it will always be obvious from the use in the equation itself. If, if it's not, just ask and I'll point out which one it is there. But anyway, in general, you might have some uh, input vector z, which is actually you know, two or three dimensional maybe, or maybe even much higher than that. 
Um, and you want to take a, the, the, the polynomial features here are a set of all possible products of certain elements of zi to the bi-th power, where the uh, sum of these bi terms is just less than or equal to the maximum degree. So this sum here could be, you know, for some b's you'd have some terms to the zero, so those just wouldn't exist in there, some terms to the one, some terms squared, etc. Um, the sum of all those terms has to be equal to the maximum degree of the polynomial. Just definitional here. Um, but, it's, but it's good to keep in mind that there is a more general form to this than just a single dimensional case. Or single input case. Single dimensional input case. And one way to look at this kind of features is kind of as a graph, right? So you could see um, this would be sort of, you have your input here. So this is x. I. I'll just call it z because I've been using z elsewhere here. So this is your input z. Um, I'm not labeling axes intentionally here. Actually, maybe, 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 maybe I will. I'll, I'll say this goes from 0 to 1, but really that's kind of a scaled value. If these inputs, like the high temperature, um, go from you know, 10 to 95, you'd want to scale this to be within the range of 0 to 1. That actually is optional because the scaling can always happen in the theta parameters themselves. Um, but you might want to scale them just for numerical reasons. You know, things get really big when you start taking big terms to the fourth power, say, for example. So this would be phi 1 of z, right? Um, this term would be phi 2 of z. And something like this, it's a bad squared term, but whatever, would be 3 phi of z. So for every point of possible input, these have different values, right? And these, you know, so, so when, if one of our xi's was there, say, the feature vector would comprise of these three values. But it's defined for really any value of these parameters here. Sorry, of the input. Okay, so that's one very common form of features. And there are a lot of possible features. They can be whatever you want. And actually, a lot of work in machine learning goes into just engineering very good features for specialized domains. I'm going to talk about kind of generic features you can use in any domain, but vision has its own features. Um, also for different domains, that's actually the one I can think of. NLP will have its own features. These kind of things, people put a lot of time in designing features. And actually, one of the big trends of machine learning uh, these is actually ways of coming up automatically with features, so you don't need to hand code any of these. But we won't get into any of that here. This is sort of very, very, yes. Um, what are we are polynomials? Yep. Right. Um, this correct I know, but I know to some of the questions are non-linear. Mm -hmm. It should be non-linear in terms of the coefficients, right? So I'm using the word nonlinear because the output function is a nonlinear function of the input. Uh, the, uh, our predicted value is a nonlinear function of the input. Um, I think that's a standard use of the term. You can also say that we have to be able to have some nonlinear function of our, of our thetas here to have it be nonlinear because really this is linear regression here. I mean, this is the same solution. Some people would call it that. Um, I will say that I think that the majority of nonlinear methods, at least in machine learning, is actually linear models, just they result in nonlinear functions, if that, if that makes sense. So the, the output, or the predicted output, is a nonlinear function of the input through this feature mapping here. Because this feature mapping is nonlinear, you get a nonlinear prediction. Um, the function here is still a linear model in some sense. So it, it's kind of semantic, but, but I'll use the term nonlinear here to mean uh, wh what I'm saying here. The, the output is a nonlinear function of the input. Both terminologies are, are, are kind of common, so. So polynomials are one very common type of feature vector. The other, well, a other and other, um, are 
called radial basis functions. And knowing these two, you'll actually probably be able to know a lot of papers you'll see will use one of these two. And that covers a lot of kind of what people use in terms of generic features. So a radial basis function is essentially, you can think of, as kind of a bump centered around some point in the input space. So I'm drawing now the equivalent graph of this graph here for radial basis functions. They're defined in terms of a center, which I'll call mu j. And there are, again, should be k of these, not n of these. Um, u, oh, sorry, sorry. No, I take it back. u j is a vector in Rn because the input is a vector in Rn. And there are going to be k of them. Right, so, so this maps n-dimensional inputs to k-dimensional features. And the mapping is just defined as following. It's kind of like if you've ever seen a Gaussian function before. Um, there's no probabilistic interpretation here, so I, I shy away from that, that term. But essentially, it's defined by an RBF center, which I'm using the letter mu, which is also used in the Gaussian because it's kind of like the mean of this bump or the center of the bump. Um, and then some bandwidth sigma. And what these are is just a function that, again, tails off to zero pretty quickly because it's exponentially decaying. And is centered at some point mu j, where at mu j that will take on the value 1. Because we're not normalizing this at all, we're just leaving it as, a, as the unnormalized exponential here. So when this thing is 0, i.e. we're evaluating it, our input z at the center, it'll be 1. If we're very far away, this thing will be very big. This thing will be very big negative, and so very, uh, very small. And then um, the whole thing will go to 0. What this captures is kind of local behavior of a function. And what I mean by that is each of these different basis functions are positive at a certain point of the space around their, their center and go to zero kind of everywhere else. So if you end up putting a coefficient on, say, the jth feature here, whatever our coefficient theta j is, it will really only affect the predictions kind of right around this center. If we're far away, then that'll be zero, so it won't really add anything or subtract anything if they, j is negative. That's, that's sort of, don't worry if you don't quite follow that yet. You'll do some experimenting with these feature vectors in the homework, so you'll kind of get some intuition about how they work. Um, but essentially, one way to think of this is just as a, again, as a mapping from n-dimensional inputs, in this case, for this graph, n being 1, to some k-dimensional output. And they're obviously a nonlinear mapping, because this is clearly a nonlinear function of the input. Yeah? Mu j's are known before Yeah, so mu j's are known. Um, and so a big question here, of course, is how do you pick what the mu j's are, and how do you pick what that bandwidth is? Um, those are both just free parameters you have, right? And Different choices there will actually affect how they perform. They'll result in different functions. Also, maybe just the number. Right? For like a polynomial, all you had to pick was the total number of them. Right? You pick the max degree d. Here you have to pick the number, you have to pick the means, pick the variances, or the, the I shouldn't use that term. It's not mean and variance. It's centers and bandwidths. Um, but so there's a lot more things to pick, right? There are some kind of heuristic choices here. So one thing I will do frequently is I will just pick a number of RBFs. So here I picked, what is this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven RBFs. I have some range of the input, and you do sort of have to have some expected range of the input, because if you don't have that, I mean, remember again, we're sort of talking about predicting things that are similar to what we've seen before, so if you try to predict something way off, it doesn't really matter, but you pick your range of your input, and you just, just uniformly pick the centers in that range. 
In higher dimensions, this, this gets a little harder. You have to do like a multi-dimensional grid now rather than just a single spacing, but it still works, works well. Um, so you pick just a uniform spacing for your centers between your, say, minimum value here and your maximum value. And then you have to choose your bandwidth now. There's no justification to this whatsoever, but the bandwidth is kind of like a variance parameter for a Gaussian. So essentially, these will have some, you know, whatever, 60% of this probability, or this, not probably not, 60% of this mass here will be within one standard, well, 66% will be within one standard deviation, one bandwidth apart, right? So I pick usually my, my sigma here to be the distance between these two things. That's completely ad hoc choice. It's just a choice that tends to get pretty good coverage over a lot of things for reasonably low dimensions. But for high dimensions, it's very hard to use these anyway because, as we'll see in a second, the number of them explodes. Um, so that is one choice of how you can pick sigma and mu j kind of methodically where all you have to specify really is the, uh, is the, is the number of RBFs. Yeah. Would that method still work if your um, data weren't, if say there were a heavy cluster of data that were, you know, around a certain input, mm -hmm. and if you're spacing your mean uniformly? Right, so it doesn't, I mean, it, it might not work as well, right? So if you have a setting where you have, say, a really simple function over in some spot, and then something really crazy and complex that gets all kind of weird, but yet still very predictable over here, um, maybe because you want something like that or something like that, then, then yes, that would not be fitting that with this model. I mean, you, you wouldn't be good at representing that here. Um, as I said, there's lots of ways you can do it. And so you could, of course, define new RBFs just with lots of sensors here and not many here. And there are all sorts of ways of actually adapting RBFs to you know, change their, their means and their uh, bandwidth based upon performance in the data and you're know, adding more where the performance is bad and, and things like this. Um, we won't cover that. There are a lot of ways of kind of, again, they're mainly heuristic, but there are a lot of heuristics for, for addressing that kind of thing. Um, we'll just assume that, that we have some RBFs. Um, and again, that technique I gave about the uniform spacing and the bandwidth setting, that's completely, I almost feel bad saying that because it's just completely, completely ad hoc there. It's just something that can work okay if you have, you know, kind of a nice spread of your data and it's kind of smooth and has similar kind of curvature throughout the whole function, so. All right. So this is great. We have nonlinear features. We can have nonlinear functions. Uh, there are unfortunately a couple problems. And there really are two distinct problems, and it's important to understand the difference between these two distinct problems. The first is computational. As we have higher dimensional input, so right now we just had a 1D input, so it wasn't too bad, but let's say we have high temperature and low temperature, maybe we want to add humidity there, other things to our inputs, and we want to have features that represent all these combinations then we get a blow up in the number of features that we have. So for example, if we want polynomials, and when I say polynomials, I mean, you know, if, if we have some term z here, um, say z is an R3, we really do want to have the z1 cubed, say, you know, z1, z2, z3, uh, z1 squared, z3, et cetera. We want to have all possible combinations here. If you want to just have them for each one individually, that's a choice, but then you can only you sort of limit yourself kind of to functions that are nonlinear along the dimensions, but don't really capture correlations. Nonlinear functions that are, they don't capture nonlinear functions that are they're sort of nonlinear in these cross products here. Um, so if, if you want to capture all these things, which are really the full polynomial basis for your input, you're going to start getting a whole lot of features. Um, if you have a maximum degree d, an n-dimensional input, you'll have n plus d choose k total features in your polynomial feature vector, which for, let's see, for a fixed input, 
n would grow like a very fast polynomial. It would grow like d to the n. This grows very quickly. Um, it's even just as bad or even a little bit worse sometimes for RBFs. Um, RBFs, if you want to have, you know, we had our 1D one, one grid here. If you want to have a 2D grid now, you have to put RBFs around every point in 2D space. So that's n squared of them. If you want to have a cube, three inputs now, you have, and you, you, you have your number of sort of divisions you, you want here cubed, and etc. These keep going up and up and up. So if D, so you suppose you want D centers along each dimension, and you want to really capture the entire grid like this, you'll of course have D to the N different uh, features, which will grow very fast. And pretty soon, you can't even store these in memory. That memory will just, you know, MATLAB will start being very slow. It won't pro prohibit you from doing it. It'll just start being very slow when it starts hitting swap space wonderfully. Um, so again, in both cases, these are exponential in the size, or I guess even here, technically a high degree polynomial, but depending on which term is held fixed there. Um, but essentially, grow very, very fast, and pretty soon you can't even store this many features. So great that we have this representational power, but you know we can't even write down the features. It's not so good. That's the first problem. The second problem, which is different, is what's called what I'm calling a representational problem. This problem says, as you get more features, the function we have becomes very expressive. We can really, you know, if we have k features, and k is really big, we can actually express, I guess technically putting it, if k is bigger than our number of inputs, m, we could actually always, just by some basic linear algebra here, we could always get zero error in our function. Essentially by effectively just coding what each point's output value is. I guess that's only true if they have different, if the inputs are all distinct, but still. So, the problem is that, and, and we'll formalize this a lot more when we talk about evaluating methods in terms of training and testing and kind of overfitting and these kind of things, but just very informally, what you get when you have, say, a polynomial, is that if your data consists of only some number of points, say five points, with a fifth degree polynomial, you can fit this data exactly, right? You can do something like this, this just fitting it exactly. And that might be a great function, or at least squares things as a great function to fit this data, because you have zero error after all, zero loss. Um, but on points very, in, in some sense this is really a bad function, right? Because on points very close by, it actually is Predicting something that's nowhere near to being right. So, again, we'll formalize this a lot more shortly, but just intuitively, this looks like a bad approximation for this function, right? Um, you wouldn't want to have an approximation like this. This was your input data. And in fact, we can see this in the data we have ourselves. So. There's a lot of data points here, so it actually, we do okay for a while, usually in the middle we're sort of doing all right, um, but you can start seeing some overfitting on the edges of our data set. So you know, one, degree one polynomial, probably not that good, just so lying through it. Degree two maybe a little better, maybe degree four even better. Degree 50 though, um, all of a sudden you're sort of doing some very weird things at the boundaries here. And as you can see, this basically makes it go through this point exactly. This hits this point exactly right here. Maybe that one exactly too. Um, but you know, this, this is in the range of our data here. We shouldn't be predicting we're going to use negative however many gigawatts of energy. That's probably not a very good prediction right around there. The same thing happens for RBFs. Um, this is again RBFs with, oh sorry, this shouldn't. Ignore this little thing for now in the label. This is RBFs with um, those uniform spacing I mentioned before and the bandwidth chosen according to that heuristic. Um, you can also make RBFs 
a little bit less expressive by increasing that bandwidth. Um, we'll get to that when we talk about kernels a little bit more because that will be the way we do that there. But you can essentially get the same type of behavior here. For a few RBFs like 2, you might not fit it quite well enough. Maybe 4 is looking better now. Um, 10, you know, looks about the same. Uh, 50, all of a sudden you're doing some really weird things here that probably have no real, real meaning. This, again, has lower loss, has less error in our optimization problem, um, but there's some sense in which that isn't really what we want to optimize, right? Just the error there. And in fact, I think there are it's four years of data, so there are, you know, about 1,400 points, 1,500. Uh, so with 1,500 RBFs, we could have a crazy thing there that, that fit them all. I guess that, that there, there would have to be two, there has to be a different high temperature for every day. But if there was, if we're measuring it like an exact high temperature here, we could fit it exactly there. It's probably not quite what we would want to do, though, for getting a good predictor. So there are a few ways to deal with this problem, the representational problem. And I'm actually going to talk about this one first instead of the computational one, because the computational one will lead us into kernels. But before we get that, we really have to talk about how we deal with this rep representational issue. So assume right now that we, we don't have any concerns about the memory size. Uh, we're not concerned, you know, we have plenty of memory, plenty of speed. We can compute the least squared solution, fine. Um, however, as you saw, even for 50 different RBFs there, 50 is not hard to compute. Uh, it's very within our, within MATLABs that can do it in milliseconds. We still have the case where um, we're overfitting to the data. And so one thing you can do is what you saw before, is just pick less expressive features. Right? You pick a 50 dimensional RBF, well don't do that. You didn't need that. Just pick a 10 dimensional one or a 4 dimensional one. Your function was smooth enough where you could do that. Um, the second possibility is called regularization. And I, let me see how much time we have here before I delve too deeply into this. Okay. I'm going to describe this and then we'll, we'll end before talking about kernels. So the idea here is that to make this crazy function, we had to pick very big values of co the coefficients. What we were doing essentially is picking very, very big values such that it would you know, go exactly to these different points here. Um, you can't really make a function that's crazy like this with low value coefficients. Uh, you can just try to convince yourself of that. You know, if, if, if our input here is something like this, these are, you know, these are our features. Are those supposed to meet up there? And you have even more like this, whatever. Um, it'd be hard to make a super expressive function there if you, you know, can't use very high dimensional coefficients. The only way you can do it is basically cranking up the coefficient really high for one of them and really low for the other one and that makes it do these kind of weird, these weird things here. So let's not allow that. Let's say that we don't want to just minimize the loss here. We're also going to minimize the two norm, the size of our vector theta. Does that kind of make sense? Why we might want to do that? Because if we don't have too big of a theta, and remember that the two norm is just the sum of the entries squared, so it measures how big the values are. If we don't have too much going on, you know, if we don't have too big of a theta here, we can't have situations like this where we're just going crazy. Um, and you know, fitting these things exactly because this term would have to be really big. And by minimizing some balance of these two things, and that precise balance is determined by this parameter lambda, which we're calling the regularization parameter, we can trade off essentially between if lambda is really big, well, we'll then we'll just look at this entirely and just pick theta equals zero. Not a great solution, but if it's really, lambda is really small, we might pick something that fits this too, too highly. So we can trade off between these two things. 
And in fact, we'll also come back to this issue when we talk about evaluating methods and training and testing sets. But right now, I just want to think of it in terms of penalizing lambda is something we might want to do to avoid situations like this. I'm sorry, penalizing theta is something we might want to do to avoid situations like this. Um, one thing you can do now is take kind of the set of all possible lambdas and look at the resulting norm of theta and sum of the losses. So this, is, this next figure does that. And it's sort of important to, to see what's, what's happening here. What this next figure does is I ran that problem, that opposition problem, a lot of times with different values of theta. And those gave me different points on this line here. And so maybe I picked some value of theta. Well, actually, let me just sort of fill out this figure point by point here. So say, so this again, the x-axis here, this is an important figure sort of to, to be familiar with. These are called sometimes Pareto optimal curves um, for, just put their name after, but uh, they capture kind of all the possible points you might want to pick. I, I'll, I'll, I'll get back at that in a second, actually. So on the x-axis here is going to be the norm of theta. In fact, norm of theta squared. Two norm of theta squared. And on the y-axis is going to be our cost. This is the sum. Remember, j theta was the sum of, our, of our, all our examples of the loss in each example. Now, if we pick lambda equal to 0, this is uh, 20, I'm using 20 RBF features here. Just as an example for some features that can overfit but don't have to overfit. Um, if you pick lambda equal to 0 in this problem here, this is just the least squares problem, right? Now, here I have 20 RBF functions. And there are, say, 1,400 examples. So I can't quite get zero error. So j does not go to zero here, importantly. It's, it's actually above zero here, despite maybe what it looks like from the figure. Um, but that'll be some point down here on our curve. Because this least square solution will have some norm. right? It'll have some norm. This is what it is. Um, and it'll have some error that it achieves. So no matter what. We can't do any better than that. We can't get any lower error because we've already let theta be whatever it wants to be. On the other side, if I were to run this problem with say, whoops, with say theta equal to, I mean, really, really big value going to infinity, we get a point up here. This would be the point where theta equals zero. And theta equals zero, now what? that achieves some error. Uh, it's not going to get any, there's no point in having any theta that has more error than that, right? Um, but it's probably going to have a pretty high error there. What this curve shows is all the possible options in between those two extremes. So if I pick some intermediate theta, maybe I get a point here. I achieved this cost using this norm. The cost here, again, does not include the penalty on the norm. It is just this first bit here. I run it again, I get something like this, blah, blah, OK. And this is just showing the line connecting all these things together. And a nice reason for a, a graph like this, which is how people often use and define Pareto optimality, actually, is that any point on this curve is kind of a good point in some sense. Right? It's, it's, it's sort of, I, you know, I can't argue with, if you pick, if you were to say, I like this point right here, I really couldn't argue with you because you probably have some trade-off. You know, you want to trade these two things off in some manner. So if you pick that one right there, I have to say, okay, that's, that's a good choice or that could be a good choice um, and leave it at that. Now, if you were to pick this point up here, if you were to give me some theta that uh, resulted in a point up here, I could say that's a bad choice. Because right, I could give you a point that had both lower norm of theta 
and lower cost. And so what the Pareto optimal curve shows is all the points that could be optimal under some definition, under some trade-off of these two uh, costs here. This is a general kind of technique uh, for multivariate optimization. When you have two different objectives you're trying to kind of both keep in check, Pareto optimality is kind of a good way of plotting that. Okay, I think that is, my alarm's going off here, so I know it's about time. Okay. So, what you can see from this chart here, is these graphs here, is this, these graphs show this, this, this behavior exactly. So, if we have 50 RBFs, but choose lambda equal to zero, that'll give us the least squared solution, right? So it's this one with lots of, lots of bumps in it, things are going off all over the place, etc. Um, if we increase lambda, you know, it, you might say it's not quite as good looking a fit as before, but it's actually not bad. It's simply just as bad on a couple things up there. For the most part, it's getting a pretty good fit here. If we increase lambda though, then all of a sudden these great big up and downs here start going away. Because for a very small decrease in lambda, we can actually get things that perform almost as well, for, and for a lot of these things it performs just basically as, basically as well, um, but it doesn't have these big bumps there because we penalize the norm of theta. Now if we penalize it too much, you start getting things like this, right? So here we always don't want almost any theta at all, and so all it does is maybe puts a few, little bit of weight here on some of these thetas over here. Um, remember, when I'm saying theta's over there, I mean weight on the RBFs that correspond to the locations over here. Um, so again, you have the same trade-off of things that kind of look like a good fit versus things that just are boring, don't capture the data, and things that are too expressive. So just like taking different features regulations is a way of choosing between those different options. What I'm going to talk about next time and we'll end here, but what I'm going to talk about next time is a way of addressing the other difficulty of features. And that was the computational difficulty. The fact that we can't even store or maybe solve the least squares, solu final least squares solution when we have big high dimensional nonlinear features. There's a trick called kernels, which are, again, all the rage these days, or have been the rage for, for a long time now. So. All right, great. See you next time.